Locate in your Bibles this morning the Old Testament prophecy of Jeremiah and the third chapter. Jeremiah chapter 3. Our brother Michael read a few moments ago a couple of passages, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, that shape a distinctively Christian view of divorce. There's much more that the Bible has to say on that subject. It is a difficult subject. It is a painful subject. It is a complicated subject. But it is one that touches... I dare say, all of our lives in some way or other. Fewer and fewer people are getting married these days. And there may be a whole host of reasons for this, given the high praise we saw given to a life of singleness just a couple of weeks ago. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be suggested that the inability of many in former generations to commit to an enduring marriage has led millennials to an unwillingness to even head down that road. Or at least to delay it. With the declining marriage rate comes naturally a declining divorce rate. Fewer people getting married automatically entails fewer people getting divorced. But of those who do get married, fewer of them are getting divorced. Good news, right? All is well. Maybe we as Christians don't really have to grapple with divorce and its consequences, and we can just move on. Well, unfortunately, we do have to grapple with it because it is a reality that impacts all of us, as I have said, and it is a reality that God hates. Think back to the first passage that our brother Michael read a moment ago there in the prophecy of Malachi where the Lord communicates his displeasure to the people because they have, particularly their men, have been unfaithful to their wives. This second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. And you're crying and you're saying, oh, God's not hearing me. God's not listening to me. God's not answering my prayers. God's not pleased with my sacrifice. And He says, why? You wonder why? I will tell you why. Because the Lord was a witness between you and the wife of your youth. To whom you've been unfaithful. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. God is not impressed with unfaithful men. God is not impressed with adulterous men. Promiscuous men. Cheating men. God does not hear or answer the prayers of those who are unrepentantly so. Why? Because God was a witness in their marriage. God was a witness in their union. In fact, He provides them, He says, with a portion of the Spirit in their union. That is the, uh, the old three-corded um, uh, rope uh, that, 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 that there's a man and there's a woman and there's the Holy Spirit. And what God has joined together, let no man tear asunder. Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth, he said. Um, And and then he goes further and says, The man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, covers his garment with violence. Now, there might be someone here today with an older translation of the Bible or maybe a different reading for that verse. Does anyone have a King James Version? New King James. Michael, what does Malachi chapter 2, verse 16 say? Malachi 2, 16. And it says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he 
There you go. That's it. That's uh, why the difference. Uh, the difference is is with translation. Remember, the Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Uh, the ancient texts of the Hebrew are not actually always very easy to translate accurately into the English language. For the most part, they are incredibly accurately translated, but there are a few points. In fact, most of our Bibles will have a footnote where they have had difficulty translating it to show that they're taking great care with God's Word in communicating it in our language. They put a footnote to say that this... They're convinced that the rendering in this newer translation is, is accurate. Um, it's verse, my footnote says, probable meaning. The man who hates his wife but divorces her covers his, his um, violent garments with violence. But the alternative reading is the Lord hates divorce. Basically, the Lord, the God of Israel, says that he hates divorce and him who covers his garment with violence. So there's, there's a, a, it, it, it's all about grammar and translation at that point. It's nothing that should reduce our trust in the text and its reliability and its accuracy. Both sentiments are completely accurate. The whole point of God saying the man who hates or does not love his wife but divorces her, covers his garment in violence, is to express God's hatred of divorce. God hates divorce. Now, I told you to turn to Jeremiah 3, and we're going to get there, but we're just, we're just holding it back a bit longer than we might normally. God hates divorce. All is not well. Even with the declining According to some sources, a plummeting divorce rate is estimated that 42% of marriages in the UK will still end in divorce. 42%. Of these, 26%, well more than a quarter, were previously married and divorced, making this a second or a third or a fourth divorce. Prior to the current divorce, uh, a legal technology company operates primarily online. Uh, legal Zoom quite articulately presents why this is bad news. They say, quote, divorce hinders society by dissolving families and weakening belief in the family as an essential social unit. To sociologists, the family does more than unite people by marriage and blood or adoption. It provides the educational, financial, and emotional support its members need to thrive socially. Without this support, divorced adults and their children are mentally and physically weakened. They become less productive social participants. More broadly, divorce leads people to question whether having a family is even worthwhile. The Heritage Foundation reports that children of divorced households tend to enter high-risk marriages. Even worse, says researcher Patrick Fagan, is that these children often do not marry and start families of their own at all, a phenomenon that can disturb social harmony. So divorce has an impact on the whole of society. It has an impact on the couple, on the family, on the children, by extension society. Unhappymarriage.info says when a couple divorces, they will likely see their social circle change. So you're caught up in the moment and they're, they're, they're just seeing here, now, our difficulty at present. What's a way we can get out of it? And they don't realize it has much broader implications than they could ever perceive. Um, that they go from a couple to half a couple. They likely spent their marriage befriending other couples. The couple may have spent time doing activities with others as a couple. But this changes when the couple divorces. It no longer feels right to socialize with just one person. It causes a couple to think that they are taking sides when they take along just one of a divorced couple. 
The relationship changes and the divorced couple finds that their social circle narrows. They may lose their married friends and be forced to find single friends who they can better relate to during this difficult time. The divorcing couple tends to feel left out and isolated. Many turn to isolation and develop depression. Aside from these relational uh, and emotional traumas experienced even by willful divorcees, there's the impact on any children involved. It affects their health, leading to an increase in injuries and asthma among children. One would not think that those have anything to do with each other, but a sickly family results in sickly children is what the researchers are saying at least it gets worse they are also more likely to get cancer and to live a shorter life again not things that we normally would correlate the royal college of psychiatrists lists resulting feelings children experience a sense of loss they struggle with Differences in an unfamiliar family, perhaps. They, um, they are fearful about being left alone. They are angry at one or both parents for the relationship breakdown. They are worried sometimes about having caused the parental separation. They feel guilty. They feel rejected. They feel insecure. Sometimes they feel torn between two parents and feel used as pawns by one or both parents as various articles of leverage in their relationship. Insecurity, the cause of psychiatrists goes on to say, can cause children to behave like they are much younger and therefore uh, things such as um, bedwetting, clinginess, nightmares, worries or disobedience occur This behavior often happens before or after visits to the parent who is living apart from the family. Teenagers show their distress by misbehaving or withdrawing into themselves depressively. They may find it difficult to concentrate at school. The list goes on. It's kind of depressing, isn't it? I believe it can honestly be said then that divorce is a social justice issue. And yet, it's not one that people seem ready to pick up. There are plans to make getting a divorce even easier in the UK. I know it certainly is a divine justice issue. Because God hates divorce. And the rotten fruit of divorce seen in the wreckage of its victims' lives is evidence of that. And yet, sometimes it's unavoidable. Please, if anyone here, as I said, I'm saying all that I'm saying is someone who believes that all of us, including myself, are touched in some way by divorce. And some of us feel like there was no option. Some of us, even if we were to go to the scriptural things that we'll be looking at tonight about where divorce is biblically permitted, uh, still we, we, we still struggle. Um, it's unavoidable and I say that because in fact God himself knows it was unavoidable and that's the second point and I want you to let the second point sink in God hates divorce yeah first point second point God hates divorce as one who was himself a divorcee So the hatred God has for divorce is the hatred of someone who knows what it's like. Go to Jeremiah 3 just now. If a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? What, what, what's the implied answer here? Anyone? So the scenario is a man has divorced his wife 
and she has left him and she has become another man's wife. But it seems that there is an opportunity now for him him to, to go back to her because it would seem that she's gone to that other man and become his wife, but she's not that other man's wife anymore. So maybe this is a situation of twice divorced or at least the second time abandoned. Normally, will the first husband take her again as his wife? No, no, <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, it, it's, it's like absolutely not. The, the, the damage has been done. I mean, and that's what, exactly what he says. Would not that land be greatly polluted? Damaged goods. You, you, I mean, he doesn't mince his words, so bear with the strongness of his language at this point, but it's very descriptive of her behavior. Unlike the passage in Malachi where the men are at fault, in this scenario, it, it's uh, the, the parable that he's expressing. The, um, the, the, the woman is at fault. He says, you have played the whore. Strong language. Very descriptive. You have played the whore with many lovers. And would you return to me? Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been ravished? By the wayside you've sat awaiting lovers like like an Arab in the wilderness. You've polluted the land with your vile whoredom. So it's it's just sort of out there in the middle of nowhere waiting on people to come by, right? Just waiting on someone to be unfaithful with. That's pretty messed up, isn't it? And he says, showers have been withheld, spring rain has not come. Obviously, there's a problem here. There's, there's something, there's something that's, that's not quite right. And God says um, that, that He has sent away this woman with a decree of divorce. Verse 8, She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. So the person who's been cheated on in this story is God. His people have forgotten him. They've worshipped other gods. They've offered other sacrifices. They've built other temples. They've done kind of their own thing in their own way, according to their own will, design, desires, wishes. And God says, I've sent her away with a certificate of divorce. God who is forever faithful. God who is forever loving. God who is abundantly merciful and kind sends away His chosen wife with a certificate of divorce. Now, there, there are some who, who rightly hate divorce because God hates it. I hate divorce. You should hate divorce. But they hate it so strongly that they would deny the reality that it is sometimes unavoidable. Yahweh, the eternal God who created and sustains the universe, who designed and instituted marriage, who officiated the first wedding, who counseled the first couple, hates divorce with the hatred of someone who knows firsthand what it is like. And there's something almost scandalous about this. But the real scandal is the adultery that occasioned the divorce. Not that God believed that the behavior merited divorce. Are are you following me so far? I just want to make sure we're we're all on the same page um, this morning. If not, we can discuss this later. God asks, will a man go back to his twice estranged wife? We've already said the answer is no. Will God receive back an adulterous, sorry, will a man receive back an adulterous wife? The answer is in all probability, no. I met a man on Wood Green High Road a while back. He wanted food, so I took him to McDonald's. He had just been released from prison in Portsmouth, 
and he had used um, the money that they gave him upon release to get back to London and to have a couple of nights sleep in a hostel. I asked what he had been in for, and he told me uh, the sad tale. He used to manage a posh bakery in Kensington. One day, business was a, was a bit slow, and to, to be honest, um, he, he felt like you know he hadn't been spending a great deal of time with his wife. So he decided he would close shop early, and he would return home early, bringing gifts to surprise his wife. Imagine the sick feeling he had when he walked into their flat to discover her in bed with another man. My new friend promptly broke a chair over that man's head, and with the uh, leg that was left in, in his hand after that, he bludgeoned the man into a coma. His relationship with his wife was over. Her illicit boyfriend was almost over. He had to be hospitalized for a long time. And this guy was getting out of prison. Honestly, talking with him, it wasn't obvious to me whether he had many regrets. He felt the man deserved it. I mean, there's probably two reactions. There's, there's those who self-righteously might say, oh, how barbaric. That's just so, so wrong. And then there's those of us who say, I can kind of identify with the visceral reaction that he had. I'm always trying to um, minister to people where they're at and connect with them as they are. And the thing is, as I was talking with him and seeing his pain as he rehearsed this story, I had to confess in that moment to him that if I were in his shoes, in that moment, if God didn't restrain me, I would likely have a similar reaction. And rightly or wrongly, I would probably feel pretty justified in so doing. When family and friends have been through such things with an adulterous husband or wife, I'm saying my family or friends have been such things with an, through such things with an adulterous husband or wife and have kept the door open for reconciliation, I admit I'm not sure I would have that strength. I'm not sure that I understand it. Separation is one thing. Separation for some silly reason, especially. But adultery? That's very much another. If a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? No. Especially if she's prostituting herself. Sorry. She's lost it. I don't really have any interest in that person anymore. And yet, though that's how things are with man, God is not a man. God is not a man to angrily cast away forever. God is not a man to withhold reconciliation from the one who returns. God is not a man to, 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 to just let you know, all, all of that stuff that's out, uh, you know, out there that his people have done cloud his, his, his judgment, his, his love. His purposes. God is not a man to break his promise in response to someone else breaking their promise. And so the, the, the final thing that I want you to see this morning is not simply that, that God hates divorce as someone who has himself experienced it, but that God loves reconciliation as one who himself called for reconciliation and achieved it. 
let's um, uh, admit, I think we can agree on hating divorce in theory, especially if we have, have seen it up close and personal. I remember from, from childhood, on, um, you know, the, I, I, I was really into sports as a kid. I say really into sports. I, I played on sports teams. Reagan was really into sports, and I kind of got involved as well. Um, we did things together. So it was fun, and I had a great time um, and, and learned many lessons and was, was trained and mentored and cultivated and shaped by some of those, uh, those memories. But the, the thing that I remember is uh, my, my basketball coach, the first year that I played basketball, um, great guy, had everything in order. His, his household seemed well. His family seemed well. He had, he had quite a few sons. All of them were brilliant sportsmen. And, you know, he, he was a great coach. And we won um, the, the gold medal at the end of the season and the, the tournament. Really terrific start to basketball. Nice guy. But while everything was put together on the surface, not everything was put together behind the scenes. And I remember when his son told me, mom and dad are getting a divorce. They had a nice house, a nice family. The guy could coach a basketball team, but he couldn't coach his family. I remember um, two young men that I played American football with um, a couple of years, and they were nice guys. They, 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 they were, you know, fun to be around. And then they started acting up a bit. I remember what I was talking about, the effects of divorce on children. They were, they, they were carrying over into their life the stresses that they were dealing with in the home. And I didn't know that at the time. I just thought, wow, he just talked back to coach. No one talks back to the coach. I didn't mind because he was in a really good position and was taken off the field mid-game for talking back, and I got his position for the rest of the season. So that was great. Now I'm connecting the dots. And I remember later on in that season when he said, we won't be living here that much longer Mom and dad are getting a divorce. We're moving to Memphis, three, four hours away. And I just remember the casual way, whether it was in sports or, or a church or in various environments, kids would just say, I think, I think mom and dad are getting a divorce, or they are getting a divorce, or they have been divorced. And that instilled within me from a very young age a, a hatred of divorce. That was born out of exegesis, studying God's word and experience, seeing the damage it had on my friends. And I dare say we all agree. We hate divorce in theory and rightly so, but that's possibly because we don't see the other side of the coin. We think we hate divorce until we see that to hate divorce means to love reconciliation. There is one alternative to divorce. And that is enduring love through difficult times, total commitment to the marital covenant, even when the married couple feels less enamored with one another than when they started out. Even though God sent the people of Israel away with the certificate of divorce, God ultimately calls them back to himself. Read that there in verse 11. The Lord said to me, faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words to the, toward the north and say, what? What's the word? Return. Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look on you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. That you rebelled against the Lord your God. 
That you scattered your favors among foreigners under every green tree and you've not obeyed my voice. Return, declares the Lord, for I am your master and I'll take you one from a city and two from a family and I will bring you to Zion. That's how I'm, They've been scattered. They've been taken into slavery, into exile. And he says, I'm going to bring you home. You've gone away from me because of your adultery against me, your unfaithfulness toward me. But I'm going to go and if I have to buy you, I'm going to bring you home. He talks about how he's going to bless them with shepherds, people to lead them and feed them and sacrificially give their lives for them. Shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding so that they know the will of the Lord to do it. It shall not come to my the the ark of the covenant of They shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed. It shall not be made again. Your relics from the past, the old covenant, all the old things that I've done, those things will not be remembered. They won't be needed. I'm doing a new thing. In Jerusalem, it, it will be called the throne of the Lord and the nations will gather to it and they'll no more stubbornly follow their own evil heart. And then verse 21 A voice on the bare heights is heard. The weeping and pleading of Israel's sons because they have perverted their way. That is, they've sinned. They've rebelled against God. They've broken His commands. They have, he says, forgotten the Lord their God. They sit lonely and isolated on the bare heights, exposed to the elements, cold, crying, weeping, And they hear the voice of the Lord God. Return, O faithless sons. I will heal your faithlessness. And how do they respond? These exiles, these refugees far away. Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Truly, the hills are a delusion and the orgies on the mountains. Truly, in the Lord, our God is the salvation of Israel. They had gotten up to all sorts of wickedness, all sorts of bad stuff going on in their life. And they're like, this stuff held great promise. This stuff appealed to us. We thought we would be satisfied in these things and by these things. But no, God is our salvation. And so God not only calls for reconciliation, but He achieves it. He calls to to His lost, wayward people. And what do they do? They respond by returning. Let me be clear. We are not God in this story. Perhaps you're you're reading this and you're saying, oh, I've been hurt, I've been wronged, and I just need to... Hold out an olive branch of reconciliation. And that's hard. And yeah, we'll talk more about that this evening. But we're not God in this story. We're not God in any story. The scenario of the reconciling party and the party needing to be reconciled, we are those who need to be reconciled. We are those who are far away. We are adulterous. We are wayward. We are broken The the, the broken, divorced woman who's been prostituting herself, but whom God forgives and welcomes back. We are most hypocritical to run from reconciliation in the relationships we have in our lives. We are most hypocritical to sneer at reconciliation, to withhold reconciliation, to push back the idea of reconciliation, to reject it, to withhold it. Why? Because God has, has, has welcomed us back. And I mean, it's kind of like that, that man who was forgiven much. He had a, an incalculable debt. 
that was forgiven him. And then what did he do? He went out and he found someone who owed him just a trivial little sum. And he beat the man up and threw him in prison and said, pay me what you owe me. Jesus told that story to illustrate our double standard. God forgives us an incalculable sum and then we, pe- we, we, we treat people like rubbish. This evening, I'll, I'll discuss scenarios where divorce is permissible. The Bible has that compassion. It gives us those scenarios. Times when it may ultimately be necessary and unavoidable. But for now, this morning, I want our emphasis and, 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 and the vision of our minds and the cry of our hearts to be reconciliation. Because we are reconciled to God in Christ. God set His love upon us. Though we were unfaithful, He took residence up among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He gave His life for us to pay the legal fees so that we can come back to Him. He rose from death itself to bring us up from our relational death and to bridge the separation between us and God. So the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ compels us. It controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore all have died. And He died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. And let's face it. Divorce is for ourselves, oftentimes. A lot of the time, it is. It doesn't consider all the other factors that I've mentioned and other people around us. He died so we might no longer live for ourselves, but for Him who for our sake died and was raised. Paul continues, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Regarding according to the flesh is, is, um, is despising people. Looking down on people, uh, debasing people, maybe for things that we think we're right and they're wrong. We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. And what does he do? Reconciling us to himself, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, for Christ, God making his appeal His appeal to what? To be reconciled through us. We implore you, he says, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We who were broken, we who were Filthy, we who were rebellious and sinful, we can become the righteousness of God if we come to Him, if we are reconciled to Him. And so this morning, I want you to be encouraged that there is help for the hurting, there is hope for the depressed and the lonely, there is healing for the broken. You may be a victim of a bad marriage and divorce. God knows what it's like personally, and he loves you. You may have been betrayed. You may have been hurt. Jesus knows what it is like personally, and he loves you. You may have thought about divorce, wondering if it's for you. But God, with divine authority as well as the insight of one who has been there, done that, and has the paperwork in a publicly viewable file, no less, says, if you can help it, 
Don't think that. Don't go down that road. Be reconciled. You may be a child of divorce. And you may have trust, commitment, or anxiety issues as a result. Or even a whole host of things that you don't understand and can't quite articulate or explain. When people were trying to separate the children from access to Jesus, he said, let the little children come to me. And he welcomes you today. He welcomes you. He calls you to come to him. Into his family. Not just casually as an occasional guest in the house, but as an adopted child with full inheritance rights. But whatever the existential realities of our own life experiences, one thing we all have in common, all of us have sinned against God. All of us deserve eternal separation, eternal divorce from right relationship with Him. All of us have wandered far from the path And God calls us today through his prophet. Return to God. God calls us today through his apostle. Be reconciled to God. And God speaks these words down through the ages to today. Where in this little church. On the backside of one of our nation's busiest high roads. A simple Baptist pastor, with his own issues, says to you today, return, be reconciled, love God, love your neighbor, seek the glory of God, seek the good of your neighbor, and your neighbor includes your husband, your wife, your parents, your children, your family, your friends, those who have estranged you, those from whom you are estranged. Seek the good of your neighbor in the glory of God. Come to him this day.